Some of the finest people in the world are in the healthcare system. I mean, these are people that are healthcare providers uh, and people in healthcare in general. They really care. Not, a, they re not only do they really care, but they also are very competent. They're well trained. They deeply care about the issues, uh, the healthcare issues that are facing their clients, uh, and, and they're a wonderful group of people. A second observation is that um, if the United States were to look at uh, a healthcare system uh, that would result in uh, the most health for the most people, our system would be the last system that they would choose, the last system, uh, because our healthcare system does not produce health. I'm reminded, uh, we're here at Boston Medical Center, and one of the founders of the Community Health Center movement, who is on the uh, chair of the Board of Trustees at Boston City Hospital for many years, a guy named Herb Gleason. And Herb Gleason, great man, he, he died a few years ago. But whenever you would mention something about the healthcare system, he would stop you and he'd say, healthcare system? We don't have a healthcare system. If we had healthcare system, people would be healthy. We have a medical care system. And, uh, and he would get really angry about it. So that leads to my third uh, observation, which is uh, that we get the system that we've designed. It may, may seem like there's no design to it, but in fact there is a design. It's in a design that's opaque and fragmented. And in that opaque and fragmented system, um, I often get asked by you know, friends, neighbors, family um, to try to explain things. And you figure after 42 years, maybe I could. Uh, but when people present me with a bill from a hospital or something, I'm like, hey, I can't help you here. You know, it's not, it, these things are unknowable. When you look at the healthcare bills or me medical bills, especially that come from hospitals or even from health centers for that matter, it's really complex. It doesn't make any sense. And of course, it doesn't make any sense because it doesn't have any sense. It's usually not related to anything that has to do with like the cost of the healthcare system or whatever. It's related to how much money it can get out of the insurance companies. And that's what it's all about. So I'll, I'll mention three things that have happened to me over the last few years that, you know, that on, on a personal level. One is that my daughter was pregnant. She lived over in Jamaica Plain uh, a few years ago, and, uh, and she wanted to go to her local community health center, which was the Southern JP Health Center, which is owned by the Brigham. And she, uh, she had decent, good insurance, Blue Cross insurance, and she couldn't figure out how she could go there. So she asked me if I'd take a look at her insurance papers. So I did. And I found buried in there that if she actually went to the Southern Jamaica Place Health Center to see the midwife there, which was literally across the street from her house, it would wind up costing her $4,000 out of pocket uh, to deliver at the Brigham. So she didn't do that. And she wound up coming here, actually, and had a wonderful experience. But, you know, talk about opaque. You know, you have to dig through your insurance papers to find out what it's going to cost you out of pocket. A second element of uh, personal involvement here is a couple of years ago, I had a colonoscopy right here at, at Boston Medical Center. Uh, and, you know, colonoscopies are kind of the definition of preventive, aren't they? I mean, it's like you do a colonoscopy, if you find a polyp uh, that could turn into cancer, you remove it, and then it can't turn into cancer because it's removed. So that sounds like prevention, doesn't it? Well, the insurance companies have figured out a way of making sure it isn't. So it's only preventive if you don't find a polyp. But if you find a polyp, then it becomes a diagnostic, not a preventive procedure. And in that diagnostic procedure, you wind up getting billed. And because my employer-based insurance had a $3,000 deductible, I wound up with a bill of $1,700 that I had to pay out of pocket, which is crazy. How does, that, how does that happen? How do we wind up with a preventive procedure that isn't preventive? when it's clearly preventive. Third area, and you know, I vowed actually after that, pro, that uh, colonoscopy that I would not get another colonoscopy until I was on Medicare or some other reasonable form of, of health insurance. But that gets to Medicare. And so I turned 65 this, uh, just a few months ago. I wound up, you know, in the months before I turned 65, getting a huge pile of uh, invitations to become part of Medicare Advantage programs or Advantix or whatever they're called programs. And I put them on a pile and it grew to seven inches tall. Seven inches tall over the period of time up to my 65th birthday. And I'm looking at this and saying, God, this is crazy. I have 42 years in healthcare and I couldn't make any sense out of, you know, which one was a better plan than others or whatever. It didn't make any sense. But eventually I got a CEO of a health insurance company to work me through it and I, I chose this plan. 
and got my first bill for actually this month, which was $1,037 per month. What the hell? <laughs> you know, that's the most I've ever had to spend on health insurance, right? So I'm thinking there has to be something wrong with it, but I've gone to my Social Security office several times, and they keep saying, we'll get back to you on it, we'll get back to you on it. That doesn't include the Advantage program, $76 a month, that I have to pay. And God forbid, I don't know what it's going to cost for any pharmaceuticals. But you look at all these things, and it's Medicare A, B, C, D, the, uh, the donut hole, the Medigap insurance, all this kind of stuff. In any other, almost any other country, civilized country, you know, they give you a card when you're born, you keep it until you die, and for the most part, you never have to spend any money. So this is, you know, the American healthcare system. It's opaque, it's fragmented, it's difficult to deal with. But imagine if you were poor. Imagine if your English wasn't your first language. And, you know, that kind of stuff gets really complicated at that point. And so this past Sunday in the Boston Globe, there was an article about Dr. Deborah Frank, head of the Glow, Grow Clinic here uh, at Boston Medical Center. And I just put some of uh, the quotes on there, right? Our social safety net is nowhere near as generous as most countries for poor people. I think it's shocking and it's stupid. It's incredibly stupid. We've done lots of work to show that food insecurity costs Massachusetts about $2.4 billion in health and special education costs. Here you are disabling a whole new generation of workers for lack of investment in food, which in our country is relatively cheap. It makes me very mad. Last year, we had 30% more new referrals to the Grow Clinic than we had three years ago. We're not in a famine. We're not in a war zone. Babies are the canaries in the social mine. This is a political choice. It's a decision. And yes, it is a decision, and it is a political choice. Our system, such that it is, is designed by people who really are interested in things other than health. Otherwise, in our $3.4 trillion budget, you think you could find some money for poor kids with, for, for food, right? And we don't. We really don't. I mean, you know, we, food pantries or whatever, but that's no solution. Food pantries are no solution. And the net result of all that is, you know, what we see. The Commonwealth Fund, we're last among 11 developed countries in health outcomes, equity, and quality, despite having the highest per capita health costs. The WHO has this ranked 37th of the world's countries. The National Institute of Health has this at the bottom of 16 comparable high-income countries. Shorter lifespans for all Americans compared to the other 16 countries. And worse outcomes in nearly every category. The last one was from uh, Living on Earth, a, an NPR program this past uh, Saturday, um, which talked about how we were ranked 12th in developing countries for infant mortality in 1960, but now we're the 30, 32nd uh, rank. By the way, because I'm retired, I get to occasionally look at my cheat sheet here. So what is, what's wrong with this picture? Why, you know, why should we spend more money than anybody else and we wind up with poor outcomes, uh, people that don't live as long as other countries or whatever? And so what I decided to do is, you know, like, let's take a look at World Health Organization definition of health and how we place inside of that definition of health. So you see, it's complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So how do we do in each one of those three categories, right? So physical health, yeah, we hit it out of the park. $3.4 trillion a year spent on health care, and most of that goes to procedures, uh, surgeries, chronic disease uh, implementation. In fact, if you look at it, you know, like primary care is such a small part, it's either four or six percent, depending on who you look at, of the healthcare dollar, and most of those dollars go to hospital systems and uh, high cost things. So we're good at that, all right? Mental? No, sorry. You know, I, I, ran, a, I ran health centers for 40 years, and, um, and I can tell you that most health centers don't have much in the way of behavioral health. Because if they did have a lot of behavioral health or what, they, what their communities needed, they'd go bankrupt. And that's just the truth of the matter. And as a matter of fact, the organization I most recently ran, the South End Community Health Center, one of the reasons why we just have, are going through a merger is because we want to preserve our behavioral health services. We have a huge behavioral health department. Everybody loses money on behavioral health. And so the only way you could really preserve that system would be by eliminating administrative overhead costs and being able to put those dollars into... into uh, into behavioral health. So, no, no, we fail, fail, number two. Social well-being, God, we don't care about that in the least, really. You know, it's like, you know, here, uh, uh, Thea and, and uh, actually Kate Walsh mentioned earlier that, you know, that we're doing more, we're asking more questions about it. 
But in terms of social well-being or whether people are uh, happy, how's that? Or whether they have adequate housing, whether they had all they can, the healthcare system really doesn't care about that stuff. And so if you're thinking about it, you know, that we get what we design in the healthcare system, the people that have designed our system have failed in two of the three elements of what the World Health Organization considers health. And so you wonder why we have poor outcomes. Well, kind of got that. What do you do when you're in the system? I uh, wound up uh, in, uh, when I was 20 years old, actually, starting the Codman Square Health Center in Dorchester, for those of you who don't know Codman Square. The reason why I started was because I moved there after dropping out of college and winding up out in Colorado organizing the lettuce boycott for the United Farm Workers Union. And then coming back, uh, I wound up moving into my wife's community of Codman Square, which was undergoing hell at the time. The neighborhood was literally burning down. And at one point, the city announced they were going to close the public library building. And I was at a meeting of the community where they talked about, what are we going to do? We've got to put something in there. It'll burn down. And somebody came up with the idea, let's start a health center. I asked a lot of questions. And I was appointed the chairperson of the committee to start the health center. And that's how I went up in the healthcare system. Sometimes I think that probably the most value I've brought to, you know, to the healthcare system and to Cobham Square Health Center was the fact that I was never trained in healthcare. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have that kind of poison of, you know, believing in it. And so, um, <laughs> so what I did was, you know, I you know, looked at and listened to the community about it. Now, you know, granted, we started all the clinical programs, we had a National Service Corps grant and all that. We started the, the uh, clinical programs, and the clinical programs are excellent at Codman Square. They're actually the best I've ever seen. But if you really ask the community what they want, you know, healthcare is really, really low on the list. Even in those days, where people had to go to emergency rooms to get basic health care, because there were no primary care uh, providers that would accept them, and no community health centers before Codman. If you ask the community what they, were, what they needed, it would be things like, you know, I need to deal with violence, or the kids on the corner who are dealing drugs, or the fact that my kids are afraid to be, you know, going onto the school bus, or the fact that the schools sucked, or the fact that they didn't have any of the, the accoutrements, the, the support services that were necessary to be able to raise a kid in a low-income community. Those were the issues that people cared the most about. And so, what do you do about that? Well, one of the amazing things about community health centers is that they're nonprofit organizations. And just because the federal government has these federally qualified health center, you know, things that they get measured on, doesn't mean that you can't branch out and do all sorts of other things. Because it's a nonprofit. So Codman started starting lots of programs. The programs included after school programs for kids, anti-violence, anti-gang activities with, uh, with the Dorchester House, adult education programs, uh, all sorts of different things, including you know, providing great spaces for people to have meetings, because great communities need to be organized. And you can't be organized unless you have great meeting spaces to be able to bring people together and talk about what they want to do in their futures. All sorts of different kinds of programs that enhance the ability of, of the providers and others to be able to, to, to build a systemic approach to dealing with the healthcare systems. This is Codman Square from an old postcard back in the 60s. Welcome to Codman Square. That's Codman Square. It largely burned down in the 1970s. This is a picture from about 10 years ago. And here's the Codman Square Health Center building, the main building of Codman Square Health Center. So these are the kinds of things that happen. But we also focused, uh, through partnerships, on doing something about the things that are really, really important for health, right? If you looked at it as two things that are essential to being healthy, what would they be? Food and fitness. Food and fitness. If you're fit, if you have good nutrition, you're going to be much more likely to be healthy. But the healthcare system doesn't really care about that. You know, it's like you don't see fitness centers that are, you know, occasionally you get insurance companies that will give you some dollars towards, you know, joining HealthWorks or something like that. But, you know, for the most part, it's not really available through the healthcare system. But Codman decided to do something about that. And so, built a, a fitness center with HealthWorks, actually, that has a sliding fee scale that goes down to zero, and that allows people in this very low-income community to be able to, to participate in basic fitness exercises, including children. And this is just part of being in Codman Square. Codman Square now has this activity for the past dozen years now, actually. And the second thing is something that happened after I'd left Codman Square, but I was involved in putting this in, which is nutrition. 
This is Daily Table. Daily Table is an organization that came out of Doug Rao and Jose Alvarez, who were the CEOs of Trader Joe's and uh, Stop and Shop. And they both retired, and they went to a program at Harvard Business School where they asked, what was the worst thing that you couldn't do anything about while you were uh, CEOs of your institutions? And they said, throwing out perfectly good food, because that's what happens. 40% of all produce is thrown out uh, in, in the American uh, uh, supermarket system. So uh, they created this. They invited me to be on the board, and I immediately said it had to be in Codman Square. And this is, this is the daily table in Codman Square, where you can buy only nutritious food, because they, they have a bunch of nutritionists that de decide what can be sold there and what can't be sold there. And also, it's about one-third to one-half of the cost of it. I know. I shop there. I'm retired. I'm on a fixed income, which is right now <laughs> zero. Oh, well. But in any case, I, you know, I do shop there, and, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. They make their own food. They have a commissary that makes uh, food out of some of these products that otherwise wouldn't sell. Nothing is expired, uh, because in Massachusetts, that's illegal. And people get really, really good benefits out of this. It's interesting. So one of, a lot of the food comes from, uh, from Whole Foods, because Amazon owns them. And you know, Amazon needs to be able to provide food immediately to people, so they overbuy. So this was one day they had a, a huge amount of asparagus that wasn't going to sell. So they just ship over pallets and pallets for it worth of food for sale. Uh, and this is the commissary there. But beyond that, and this is what I want to finish up with, is that the real issue facing these lower income communities is, is really poverty. You know, all of these things are really symptoms. The problems that we see, you know, would be alleviated if, we, if they weren't impoverished. There's things that you can do, but the most important thing that you could participate in is reforming the education system, allowing for people to get more education, because education is a ticket towards being able to have more money uh, and also to be able to develop a different kind of lifestyle. So at Cobb Square, um, I was involved in starting what's now called the Edward Kennedy Health Careers Academy, which is a way in which low-income kids, if kids of color, uh, go to school so that they can become health professionals. Because in Boston, 18% of all the jobs are in healthcare, and there's no quicker way to go to the middle class from poverty than becoming a healthcare professional. So that was uh, one thing. And the second thing was really interesting, is, and this is what I'm uh, going to leave you with, because this is the kind of thing that you could participate in, which is a health center-oriented school, and that is Codman Academy. Codman Squared is, uh, is what we're calling this thing, but it's the Codman Square Health Center and Codman Academy, and Codman Academy wound up inside of the Codman Square Health Center, partly because, uh, as John mentioned, it was a Mexican restaurant that I tried to put into the building, uh, and I couldn't get anybody to take it. And then all of a sudden, uh, a woman named uh, Meg Campbell, uh, who I'm going to get married to in two weeks, came to me and said, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I came to me and said, I got this idea for putting a, a school inside of a health center, and I said, let's do it. Um, and so what has happened over the years is that we, you know, we have this school that is doing, it's a six-day-a-week school for high school kids and five-day-a-week for elementary school. And, and it's in the health center, you know? So these kids see health professionals on a daily basis, walking through the halls, where their classrooms are, where, you know, things are shared and all that. And this is something that, you know, frankly, you could do. So here's some kids in the back of the health center. They have planted a, a garden that they harvest food from and use in the kitchen that serves both the health center staff and the students. And everything is made fresh every single day, and everything is nutritious. Here's the students inside the Great Hall. Cabin Squared uh, is unique. Actually, there's only one organization that's replicating this, and that's the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative out in East Palo Alto, California, which has used the Cabin Squared model as a model for what they're doing out there. The whole idea is let's create a systemic approach to dealing with things, have kids have access to different kinds of services, and to, you know, to be able to uh, participate in understanding what health professions are all about. It's not a health profession school like Edward Kennedy Health Professions Academy is. It's, it is a school that hopes that people will become professionals and gives them opportunities to check out the healthcare system as one of those. Focusing on the social determinants of health, making sure that all of the kids have access to only nutritious food. In fact, um, sugar-sweetened beverages and junk food are banned from the entire campus as a result of uh, Codman Academy's Nutrition Club. 354 students, 95% students of color, really poor kids in, the, in general, and 100% of college acceptance rate. I envision screening happens for all the kids in the school. 
Dental screening, oral health screening, really, really important for kids. Sexual health uh, education, which is obviously really, really important, especially for kids that are teens. These are things that are able to be uh, developed because of the fact that this is a school located inside of a health center. There's no reason why these can't happen all over the country. And as a matter of fact, going to community health center conferences in the past, what you'd hear is, there's a dearth that we need more kids of color into the health professions. But nobody came up with an idea on how to do that. And if you wait for kids to go to college, oftentimes it's way too late. So how about starting your own school? All of the high school kids wind up in uh, internship programs at the health center in their junior and senior year. And then in the summertime, 25 students are hired by the health center. This is the idea. So I started off talking about why the healthcare system isn't working, and maybe we ought to be focused on different things, but recognizing the fact that we, as healthcare people, have very little to do with changing the system, right? Try as you might, it seems like the healthcare system is intractable and difficult. But you can do things with it, not only just adding to programs and dealing with the social determinants of health, but you can also do things that are going to be much more long-term, like building schools. And since this is a charter school, uh, the Edward Kennedy is also a charter, but it's part of the Boston public school system, we can do things that are going to be very powerful for our communities, change the cycle of poverty, and make a difference in people's lives or the places we go to, just by looking at what we can do out of the existing system that we have, and what kind of organization is capable of broadening its own definition of health to accomplish more. Thank you.